thank you. It's great to be here, and I'm so glad to see such a good turnout. Um, how many people have been to Pittsburgh before? Okay, great. So about maybe about a third of you. Well, um, earlier this evening I was talking to Aton, and he said, "Pittsburgh, what's happening in Pittsburgh?" What Anything great? No one really ever hears anything about Pittsburgh. So I am now armed with some statistics, thanks to you. I wanted to um, come ready to, so that I could tell you a little bit about uh, why this presentation is important and why Pittsburgh is important and is now becoming a city um, on the map that people are actually going to uh, with, with respect to green building, sustainability, and really being one of the leaders in um, sustainable design. So as it currently stands, Pittsburgh ranks 15th in, um, uh, out of cities, out of US cities, in having the most LEED certified buildings. And that's at 75 LEED certified buildings. That was as of November 2011. Uh, the top three cities are Chicago as number one, New York City is number two, and DC is number three. But if we think about the population in those three top cities versus the population in Pittsburgh, which is only right around 300,000, Pittsburgh actually ranks pretty much close to the top, um, with one green building for every 4,000 people, versus Chicago, one green building for every 10,000 people. So in my mind, I think we're doing pretty well there. Uh, and, and out of states, we rank seventh in the number of LEED certified projects. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of the larger states um, above us there. But, so that's where Pittsburgh is. And, and, and people may not be talking about Pittsburgh everywhere yet, but hopefully they will be soon. Uh, and one of the, 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 landmark, uh, the landmarks in Pittsburgh that people are talking about is Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. And I just spent the last four years working at Phipps. Um, helping them with a master planning project uh, with their LEED, LEED Platinum uh, Living Building and Sustainable Sites Initiative project. And what you see here is the old historic building in the back. Phipps is a public garden and botanical garden. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Phipps before? A couple of you. Okay, so maybe those of you who are maybe a little bit more interested in gardens. But if you do go to, to Pittsburgh, if you get there in the future, I definitely recommend a visit. Um, but it, it is a historic building, and you actually can see some uh, newer building in the front. But I'm going to talk tonight, I'm going to focus the talk on the, new, the, the third phase of the master plan. But before getting into that, I wanted to give you a little bit of history so you can understand where we've been, where we came from, and where we're going. So Phipps is really well known in Pittsburgh and among garden enthusiasts nationally, internationally, for beautiful flower shows. Um, any, any season, if you go to Phipps, uh, you'll always see beautiful flowers and many, if not the majority of our visitors still today, uh, come to Phipps for the flower shows. And we're also known now for um, including art exhibits in the flower shows as well. And some of you may be familiar with uh, Dale Chihuly up in the top left is a uh, brilliant glass um, blower, glass maker uh, with a really wonderful team, uh, Frable Glass. And we're always exhibiting some cultural values in, in the gardens as well. And I should mention, I'm, I'm saying we, because I'm still working with Phipps remotely, um, helping them finish up this project. So, um, so that's why I'm referring to Phipps in, in the first, first person. Uh, but Phipps over the last decade has also become known as an educational resource in Pittsburgh and nationally uh, for children's education, uh, now moving into the realm of research and, and teaching children about the connection between nature, plants, and people and how uh, nature can play a part in our lives. Um, botanical art, botanical horticultural classes, um, as well as uh, we, we work with researchers in the field, ethnobotanists and other horticulturists who bring back information from botanically rich areas around the world and interpret our uh, education programs. And who are we? Uh, the staff at Phipps, horticulturists, scientists, ecologists, landscape architects, uh, folks who are really interested, edu educators as well, folks who are really interested in, in making that connection between people, plants, um, and the environment, and, and now moving into sustainability as well. So over the last decade, Phipps actually changed its mission statement, uh, moving from an education and horticulture organization into an, into an organization that's really focused on conservation and sustainability. So they actually included the word sustainability in the mission statement because the board of directors believes so, so, um, they believe so much in sustainability and, 
and creating and operating an organization that reflects our values and our mission uh, that they actually wanted to have that word in there. So we're always uh, being directed by these words. So Phipps has a long history, and this is an image, we believe, from the early 1900s, but Phipps, was, Phipps began in 1893 and was a gift to the city by Henry Phipps, who's on the left, and Mrs. Henry Phipps, who I guess at that time, you know, I don't know what her name was, but um, they're standing here together in, in Pittsburgh, close to, close to Phipps, and he built the original glass houses, nine glass houses, for a sum of $100,000 in 1893. And if you can imagine building one glass house now uh, for $100,000, you wouldn't even come close. So he built Phipps Conservatory with the intent of having a space for everybody to come, learn about plants, um, and have an appreciation for um, nature. So he was a forward-thinking man, and Phipps was even open on Sundays back then. So um, he had it open seven days a week so folks who worked in the factory could even come and enjoy. And for a, uh, for a full century, the city owned and operated Phipps Conservatory, and um, even back then, they were known for their spectacular flower shows. Um, they had many different managers over the decades. Um, as you can see here, the, the shows today are very reminiscent of I don't know why that's doing that. Um, I didn't think I programmed it to, to move automatically, so sorry about that. Um, but the flower shows today are very re reminiscent of what, what was previously uh, the mission of Phipps. But over the decades into the late 1900s, about 1970, 1980, Phipps was really falling into decline. Um, it's very expensive to maintain a glass house at 42 degree, degree latitude. Um, in the winter time, the, in a single pane glass house, the steam that we use to heat, heat the building literally just escapes through those windows. Um, also, the, the facility was really in disrepair, and there's a lot of, a lot of water was used to water plants, so the, the city just couldn't, could not keep up. Um, so, in 1993, Friends of Phipps is a nonprofit organization that formed to, take o to approach the city and take over the, org take over the facility um, as a nonprofit organization. So this is the facility, and I maybe should have shown you an image before so you had a better idea of what we were talking about. Um, what you're seeing here is, at, this is the facility as it was in 1993. The original nine glass houses run the, um, the center spine of the building. And also back here, there were a few additions. You see old production greenhouses in the back, and I think I have a laser pointer here. Um, a large central green here. We're surrounded by Shenley Park. Um, city of Pittsburgh is about five miles northeast, I would say, from here, so somewhere in this direction. Uh, Oakland is here. This is where the University of Pittsburgh is. Carnegie Mellon is literally right across the street from us here. Now you can see this building here, this is, an old, this is an old 1970s facade on the front of this building, pretty, pretty ugly. Uh, so in 1993, uh, the new Friends of Phipps hired an executive director, R Richard Piacentini, who is still at Phipps today, and he has been a visionary in the development and the master plan of Phipps. Uh, and one of his first goals, once, when coming on board, was to create a master plan. Um, a three-phase master plan that would not only expand the visitor amenities, but you saw the picture previously of the, the greenhouse looking really, really terrible. He wanted to um, tear down the old greenhouses, um, build new greenhouses, and also wanted to expand toward the back. But you can see here, this is, our, this is the limit of the property here, so we didn't really have much space to go on. So they also took a look at the front, and looking at this terrible facade, um, they wanted to welcome the world and welcome the city uh, with a new beautiful building. So the three-phase master plan took shape, and the first phase was to build a welcome center, and this is the old historic building here that I had pointed out earlier. Um, second phase, so the first phase focused on visitor amenities. Second phase focused on tearing down the production greenhouses, 
building new production greenhouses so that we could grow um, a great stock of plants and then in include a, trop a new display space, a tropical forest conservatory. So uh, with the, the master plan, the phase one and phase two additions, the idea there was to um, create a more economically sustainable organization. So to bring people in, expand, extend their visitor time uh, from one hour to two hour. And maybe they would stop and get a bite in the cafe because they were uh, including a cafe. Uh, also adding on a special events hall. Maybe they would love it and they'd want to bring their, their children back for um, a wedding. So uh, really focused on not only um, environmental sustainability but economic sustainability. And then the, the third phase, which I'll be focusing on uh, for today's talk, is uh, in the rear uh, area of this site, the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. But I am going to talk first, just briefly, about the, the phase one and phase two. I just have a few slides here. Um, so in, in beginning the phase one master plan development, this was in the mid-1990s, soon after Friends of Phipps had take, taken ownership of Phipps. Um, and let me take a step back there. The, the city of Pittsburgh still technically owns Phipps, so I should say that the Phipps, um, Friends of Phipps became a nonprofit organization, a private nonprofit, and they actually they run the organization. So, um, so technically still owned by the city, and we, Phipps leases the land. So uh, looking at developing a, building a new welcome center to, to greet visitors, um, we had some issues there because we had this old historic Victorian building behind and the Historic Review Commission was not going to permit uh, any, they were not going to permit a building that would block the historic building behind. So the architects really took a challenge and, and turned it into an opportunity. And instead of building a gigantic facility uh, that would block the rear, the, um, the building behind it, they took the initiative to build the majority of the building underground. Uh, it's an 11,000 square foot building with a cafe, um, a large atrium, and a gift shop. And, and what we realized at that point by building the building underground is not only would that allow us to um, achieve the, the mission of, of building a new building, but we are going to buffer the winter winds, um, cool the space in the summertime by locating that building underground, so cut our costs dramatically, our energy costs and our energy use. And you can see, uh, this is a picture on the inside. Uh, this is the dome that's in the scent that, goes over, that runs over the center of the building. The amount of natural light that comes into this space has cut our need for artificial light uh, dramatically. Uh, topped by beautiful gardens and a green roof. So in the end, uh, we actually built a building that um, uses 40% less energy and re uh, reduced reduce water use by 200,000 gallons every year than a, a building conventionally designed and built uh, this size. And you can see an aerial photo here of how nicely that fits in. And in the end, we did become um, a lead silver welcome center, and it was the first lead welcome center in a public garden. And for us, uh, as a leader in the public garden world, that was really exciting. <clears throat> and we were able to share our experiences uh, with other public gardens. Something that's very interesting about the public garden world is the, the amount of information sharing that, that goes on with, uh, between gardens. Because they are nonprofit organizations, there's really no competition. And we're very interested in sharing experiences, um, sharing challenges, what has worked, what hasn't. <clears throat> so by being one of the first to build a LEED certified building in, two, in 2005, we saw buildings coming online in the next few years uh, after that that we were able to help shepherd along. So moving on to into the second phase, uh, the production greenhouse, the Tropical Forest Conservatory and Special Events Hall, uh, we built on our, our experience from the Welcome Center and how great the, the design and the construction of that LEED certified building, um, <clears throat> what, how great that experience was for us. Um, and during that time building that Welcome Center, not only did we look at it as a building, as an opportunity to build a green building, but we also looked at it as an opportunity to bring sustainability into our operations. So we were looking at, we started looking at everything we did. We started questioning everything, um, even down to changing out paper towels, um, taking, uh, removing, uh, switching out soaps, 
removing antibiotic soaps from, um, from our repertoire of what we were ordering, uh, looking at our water usage. We started monitoring our water usage, monitoring our energy usage. Uh, started recycling almost everything and, and through the initiatives in the Welcome Center in our cafe and the rest of the conservatory we actually have an 84 percent waste diversion rate so that means that uh, 84 percent of the materials that are produced on or not produced excuse me that leave the site are either recycled or composted so we started implementing sustainability initiatives all throughout the conservatory so briefly, um, before we talk about the, the third phase with the, the um, Center for Sustainable Landscapes, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the other features in phase two. Uh, we did build a new set of greenhouses, 36,000 square feet of greenhouses, uh, and this is a, a very, um, not so new anymore, but, but around 2005 it was a very new technology. It's called an open roof system. And this type of a building does not have a need for a very energy consumptive fans on either end of a greenhouse. So if you're familiar with greenhouse design, you usually have one large fan on one end that sucks in cooler air, runs air through the greenhouse, and then another large fan that's continually operating on the other end, pooling hot air out. With this open roof system, this is tied into a building management system. Sensors are all throughout the buildings. As soon as it gets hotter inside than it is outside, the roof opens. And they're also sensing um, if rain may be coming. And at that moment, if the sensors are uh, sensing too much humidity, the windows will close. And you can see inside here, this is during the construction, um, energy blankets and shade cloths that help to shade the building so that uh, the building doesn't get too hot. Uh, and energy blankets during the winter time, as soon as the sun goes down, the building management system automatically closes those energy blankets to trap the heat inside all the energy that is, or all the sun, uh, the heat that is built up during the day. And I did just want to mention, this is very exciting, last month we just got the news that uh, we were just awarded LEED Platinum certification for this, for this production greenhouse for operations and maintenance. So what that means is our energy, water, materials, waste, and indoor air quality for this building have exceeded um, the, um, or I should say that we are, we've, we've reached the, the highest level of what we can as per LEED standards. And we, um, we underwent a, um, an energy benchmarking study so that we could get a better, better understanding about how much better this type and this design of building is than a conventional design. And what we found is that this, this design is 24% more efficient than traditional greenhouse design. So uh, we believe that that's a, a great achievement and something that we can share with the world. Uh, the Tropical Forest Conservatory was also part of phase two, uh, and we learned a lot from, once again, from what we were designing in the, pr the production greenhouses. Uh, this looks very different than traditional Victorian design. You see uh, one, one large swath of windows and, uh, on the roof, and then uh, one large wall of windows facing south. Uh, this, this design was incorporated because what we were able to do since we had southern facing windows on this, on this front face, we were able to incorporate double pane windows on the roof of the building so that we didn't have to worry nearly as much about all of that heat escaping the building during the day in the wintertime through the roof because the double pane windows helps to insulate it. And we incorporated windows, uh, every other row of windows opens up, which is very different than traditional conservatory design that just usually has a low window to pool and cool air, and then an upper window to exhaust hot air. Uh, with this system, coupled with earth tubes, which are built underground, whoops, sorry about that. I hope I'm not making you dizzy. Um, air comes through the earth tubes. There's an opening on this end. These are, these are buried 15 feet underground. Uh, these are 300 foot long uh, concrete pipes, and you can see here they're uh, covered with soil. So they're open on this end. And when the windows are open inside the building, cool air is pulled through these tubes. It's cooled to the 55 degree temperature. And when you balance out, maybe it's on a 90 degree day, you're pulling air inside the tubes. Uh, they're going through this 55 degree temperature tube. When they're exhausted into the conservatory, it's about 70 degrees. So we're getting a, a, passive, um, it's a passive air conditioning system in the building. So pretty great um, achievements for us there. And those buildings were built in, 2000, opened in 2006. 
So, um, and I should, I should also mention, if anybody has any questions as I'm going through here, feel free. Uh, the architect for the Welcome Center and the Phase 2 was IKM, and they're Pittsburgh-based, IKM, and they're here. This is actually backward. This slide is backward, so, so you could um, be oriented correctly. And the next, the Phase 3, the architect, uh, is the Design Alliance, also a Pittsburgh-based, the, de the Design Alliance. And I do have a slide that I'll show uh, with the, the whole design team. So moving into Phase 3. Um, lots of really great technologies were incorporated into phase one and phase two. Uh, there was a lot of excitement that was built around these projects. And you can see here, um, this is with the, the new development. Again, this gives you a little bit of a better perspective of how limited we were on space in the rear of the site. Uh, again, the park is behind us here, so really uh, very limited. It's only about a 2.65 acre site. And we had, as you'll see as we go through this, we had a lot of goals, a lot of uh, parameters uh, for this project. So we, we started to look a lot into sustainability, into green building. We started to understand, uh, learning from the experts, that, that green buildings are only as green as you can operate them. You can build a green building, and within a year, if you're not operating it to the standard that it was built, it can... It can potentially even operate more inefficiently than a conventionally designed building. Uh, we were also looking at a lot of the issues that were presented with LEED. It's a checklist, so you can get um, just as much value for uh, installing a bike rack as you can um, using an en energy recovery system. So there's a lot of issues there. Um, I, I think LEED is a wonderful system, and I think it's, it's really done uh, wonderful things for architecture and the design uh, the design world, but when we were talking, when we were looking uh, to go further, we were looking at other scenarios and what, what we could do, how could we go further, how can we actually, instead of just making, instead of just designing a building that's going to have little impact on the land, the piece of land, the region around us, how can we actually help to restore the property, uh, how can we actually help to restore out the region of Pittsburgh, and how can it contribute uh, positively to um, to the ecosystem that this building is built on. So we started thinking about ways that we could build a new building. Where is it here? Right here. So this was going to be a building. We, we, we pretty much were maxed out on space. Um, we have a lot of education classes and administrative functions that were located in an off-site building. So we're growing and we needed to bring those functions on site. And in order to bring them on site, we needed a new building. So this was really the impetus for this, uh, the design and the, the uh, construction of this new building. So looking at the Tropical Forest Conservatory uh, and the existing campus and starting to think about how we can connect the new building and the new site with the resources that we already have on campus. So trying to create more of a closed loop system, uh, something that would operate in itself, um, something that would need little input from the outside. And this, uh, this image here, our executive director, Richard Piacentini, took this image with him to Greenbuild, and I believe it was in 2007. And Greenbuild is an annual, um, annual meeting that is hosted by the U.S. Green Building Council. And he arrived a day late, and he had this image with him, and he had this vision of building this new building in his mind. And he, he was talking to somebody on day two and telling them all about his ideas. And he said, this is what we want to do. We want to connect and we want to do closed loop, you know, all of these um, different ideas. And this guy said, well, were you here last night for Jason McLennan's talk? He challenged all of the designers and everybody here to go beyond lead, to go beyond sustainable, to, to actually design and build buildings that will actually help to restore uh, what once was on a site. And it's, it's a new challenge. It's called the Living Building Challenge. So he, of course, said, no, I, I, I missed it, but I'm going to go and talk to him. So that's exactly what he did. So he learned about the Living Building Challenge. And the Living Building Challenge is um, it's a, a green building rating system, similar to LEED, but it goes beyond. There's no checklist. There's only a set of prerequisites. And the prerequisites are there's a few versions, and we're now on version 2.1. Um, our project was focused on version 1.3. So most of what I'm going to talk about is, we, we're, we're kind of morphing into 2.0 and 2.1, but 
Um, most of what I'm going to talk about is related to 1.3, and the, the spirit of the Living Building Challenge has remained the same. But what you can see here, there are six petals that the Living Building Challenge focuses on and what, it <coughs> uh, what it's built upon. Uh, site, materials, energy, water, uh, beauty and inspiration, and indoor quality. But the two main features of the Living Building Challenge that were really, really, uh, that, that we keyed into was that the building, the building, excuse me, generates all of its energy on site through renewable resources, and the building and the site captures all of the water, re cleans it, and reuses it on site. So that building and that landscape are essentially functioning as one. Um, to help make it as efficient as a flower. And considering that we are a botanical garden, conservatory, that really spoke, spoke to us. Let's see what's next here. OK. So coming back from Greenbuild, um, Richard approached the board with the idea of moving into phase three. The plan initially was to put off phase three for several years, because at that time, his board was, you know, they were tired uh, the philanthropists, the, the funders were tired of giving FIPS money, even though we'd, we'd achieved such, um, such, a, such great notoriety and had built education programs around our buildings. They, they were tired. So he, but he, he came back from Greenville, approached the board, and as he always says, he says that he, it always amazed him that they didn't run away from him whenever he came back to tell him about this great new idea, because everything had been... Um, he was worried that, they, that nobody would want to, to help with this project. But when he got back and he started telling them about how exciting it was, the Living Building Challenge, um, this is something that, that he just believed that we had to do, the board backed him and said, yes, let's do it. Uh, let's be one of the first out there. Let's help lead the way. So FIPS has an a, um, education, research, and conservation committee, uh, which is built up of community members. And initially, this group came together to create a vision for the building, to create a vision for what the next steps were. Because research was somewhat missing from our mission. We work, with, as I mentioned earlier, we work with uh, botanists and horticulturists and ethnobotanists out in the field, but we don't really do any research on site. And being an education-focused organization, we felt as though it was really important that we bring uh, that research onto our site. So, um, so they created this vision for the project uh, where we were an educational steward for the environment. And we would bring people on site to help teach them about the building and about the landscape. But we would also disseminate this information into the community to children, adults, researchers, academia, anybody and everybody who was um, interested in, in learning about it. And we were also going to be building off of history, so the glass houses and the facility that was already there. And it's interesting that this building can teach. Um, the, well, I just learned this not too long ago. Jason McLennan, who is the founder of the Living Building Challenge, um, came to speak at Phipps um, a couple of months ago and was talking about the Living Building Challenge and what it's all about. And, and I had always interpreted those words as Living Building Challenge and building being the building itself. And I'm a landscape architect. And, and thinking about that and how much this is focused on site and landscape, it always, I don't know, it, it just kind of bothered me a little bit because we always talked about the building. But it's, it's not just about the building. It's about the whole site and how it works together. And I had, this was the first time I had heard this. He said that the building, the word building is actually a verb, not a noun. So the way that he interprets it is the living building challenge as uh, building uh, being the verb in an action rather than building a facility. So keep that in your minds. That's, that's definitely changed my perspective on um, the living building challenge. So again, this committee at Phipps um, really focused heavily on education. Because this building and this landscape, what is it going to be if we can't communicate all this information and share all this information with the community? So. Um, you saw the pictures earlier. We have beautiful glass houses where we grow ton thousands and thousands of tulips for um, spring shows. And we, uh, we grow a lot of plants, tropical plants, that wouldn't naturally grow in the Pittsburgh climate. Um, but we still host those flower shows because that is um, what the community wants. That's what uh, the community is looking for. We have changed our practices, though. Uh, we have an integrated pest management specialist. 
We've incorporated nearly all organic uh, management practices and all, all, organi all organic practices for our exterior landscapes. Um, and I mentioned earlier about the waste diversion rate as well. Uh, but what we're, we were, we're looking to move into a different realm. Um, we're looking to connect horticulture with landscapes, with sites, with buildings, with um, bringing us more in harmony with nature and looking at how our buildings and our daily actions can speak to uh, our future. So looking at um, different ways we can incorporate research and education into the building and into the programs, we came up with four major topics uh, and a lot of these, um, the research projects will be uh, embarked on right on the campus. Okay, and looking at how, how will we, how will our education be, how will our education programs be interpreted and how will they be um, presented, sorry about that. Okay, how will they be informed? Uh, we were looking to create a building and a landscape that's not, we're not just going to create this and, and check something off. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a green building can only be in, as green as um, you operate it. We wanted to work, um, we wanted to embark on a process we, where we were actually, where we were ensuring that our continual operations um, were going to be as true to the design and as, as true to the building as the design was. So um, making the operation focus on experiential, functional, and technical um, aspects so that we can continue to monitor, so that we continue to tweak our operations so that we're ensuring that the operation of the building um, is as efficient as it was designed to be. And not only that, but then we can teach about it. So I talked a little bit about what the Living Building Challenge is already, uh, but I did want to mention that it was issued by the Cascadia region of the Green Building Council, and these are guys are in the Northeast. Uh, and this is a chapter of the, the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, and I mentioned, I think, earlier about the six petals. So these were the six petals that, uh, that we focus on for version 1.3. So the design focused heavily around uh, these major aspects. Um, but each of these petals, within each of these petals, there are prerequisites. And so the petals are essentially the categories that the prerequisites fall within. And some of the prerequisites, those that I have highlighted in green, were really, the, they're the, the prerequisites that were the most challenging to achieve. And those that really rang true through the whole design process. So how did we um, embark on this project? As you can see here, uh, this is the site, and we're right in the middle of an urban area. Um, we had quite a challenge. We had many, many site constraints. This is the site here. This is actually before the tropical forest and production greenhouse were built, so this is very old. Um, but this site historically was owned and operated by the city of Pittsburgh. So it was technically a brownfield because uh, their DP, their Department of Public Works used to use this as a spoils for their construction projects. They also had um, a gas tank, which I will talk about a little bit later because we've, we've found a really great use for it. A gas tank and, um, or two tanks, one that held gas, one that held oil. Uh, these tanks, one was, um, actually there were three tanks. One was uh, brought up from underground uh, the ground was remediated, so we've technically, about one-tenth of this site was considered a brownfield. Uh, the soils were stripped off of it long ago. Uh, it actually, long ago, was, was actually a quarry, which is interesting to think about. So there was really nothing here. And the uh, construction spoils from the Phase two project, pretty much, they just got pushed down in this direction. So there's actually a 30-foot cliff face here that was all fill. So really interesting site to work with. And you can see, um, as I was just mentioning, this is the upper level here, uh, mid-level. So this became actually a 30-foot cliff face and then the lower level here. And then this is a very steep slope that, that leads down into Shenley Park, which is about a 400-acre park, city park. Um, Pittsburgh's really known for their green spaces and, and the city parks. Um, the entryway is, is right about here. 
And this is the main road that surrounds Phipps, and this is the main entrance to Phipps. So this will still be the main entrance to uh, the building for visitors to the new building, which is located right here. OK, and this gives you just another, I, another view. I wanted to put as many pictures in here as possible since I figured that nobody had ever been there before. So uh, again, the lower site. You can see here, these are the phase two buildings after they were constructed. All of that, all of that soil and the extra fill built up this uh, hillside here. And there is a former, uh, there's a building here that was formerly the, the Department of Public Works building. Uh, this portion of it was removed, just this small portion. This portion remains, and the rest of the materials down here were removed. Is everyone doing okay? Anyone have any questions or anything? Okay. Okay, so because of, we had a, oh, geez, what the heck? <laughs> uh, we had a lot of, we had quite a, a challenging, um, quite a challenge ahead of us uh, with the budget being very limited. This it did end up being a 20, uh, $24 million project, but at the beginning, uh, to begin with, it was actually about half of that. So uh, we did work with several philanthropists in the Pittsburgh region who were really, um, really, they, they've always backed FIPS and they've always been um, very interested in, in uh, sustainable projects in the region. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't until after we started our capital campaign for this project that we had many of these donors come out of the woodwork and say, this is such a landmark project. It's going to be internationally known. We want to help contribute. So the project grew quite a bit. Uh, and, you, and we were talking a little bit before about the program with the research and the education. Uh, the site constraints were quite challenging and um, living building challenge here. So all of these things coming from different directions. Um, really needed to get our ducks in a row. So in order to approach a project that was going to be informed by our natural systems, um, and not necessarily informed by technology, but rather nature, the environment, uh, biophilia, looking at natural systems at our, as our model, we learned about a process called integrated design. Um, and we thought that it, it sounded right, it sounded great, because the, the idea behind integrated design is it's quite different than traditional uh, design models. And with integrated design, you're putting a lot of time up front and you're bringing all of your disciplines together at the beginning. So your architect and your engineer and your landscape architect are not working in silos, but rather they're working together from the beginning. And they're, they're looking at a project from more of a problem-solving perspective rather than just a goal-oriented perspective. Uh, and you can see here kind of a, um, an interesting model of, of how, I don't know why that keeps happening, so sorry about that, um, how the team structure ended up in seven group, which is uh, led by John Becker, who's one of the instructors here. Many of you may, have, may know him, and some of us have even take classes with him. Um, amazing, uh, really forward-thinking architect who is very into um, integrated design, regenerative design. At this time that this, this building was being designed, the regenerative design model was not, it had not been, um, been created, it had not been uh, unleashed to uh, the architecture world at that point. So, so we were going with an integrated design, but not regenerative. However, a lot of the um, the principles that we did incorporate into the project do ring true to that regenerative design model. But this is the main team here. Um, and you can see here surrounding us, we have quite a few partners, uh, project partners, organizations that were really um, instrumental in helping to uh, create the, the message and help to uh, form the message that was going to inform the design. And this is a, a quick slide. I'm just going to keep this up for a quick moment. Just of the team, what we were focusing on, because the Living Building Challenge and LEAD and Sustainable Sites Initiative, which I haven't mentioned yet, so they're so focused on regional, regional resources with materials. We also felt as though, uh, why not focus on regional resources in terms of expertise? And we also wanted this project to be a showcase for the Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania region. So why not choose 
designers and a design team that's from the local region. So that's what we did. Uh, we picked, we uh, worked with all, all the, the entire design team is from the Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania region. Aside from, uh, there was one um, cost estimator who came from Toronto because they had had experience on a project like this and we felt as that was very important. Um, but the partners down here, this was a really important component for us to bring in partners from the beginning to get everybody involved, everybody around the table from the start. Uh, people are going to help us help inform the design and um, help inform uh, the, for the direction. So as I was mentioning before, the design process and an integrated design process, process you can't really see this very well, but we have pre-design schematic design, design development, and then construction documents. And oftentimes with the traditional design model um, and construction model, you've got a lot of your time on, in the end here. So in the design development, that's where your bulk is. But with an integrated design process, you're actually bulking up right in this central space, so in the schematic design. And I just have um, some close-ups here with the pre-design at five to eight weeks. And I have to tell you that the project actually did not stay within these parameters. These were the goals and we didn't stay within the parameters. Schematic design at 16 to 19 weeks, design development at 11 to 13, and construction 14 to 16. So a lot of folks, you know, we hear a lot about this process being a lot more expensive. Um, it was for us because we're one of the first out there to use it, but as it becomes a little bit more um, integrated into the design world, what we're seeing is that the, um, the upfront cost during the schematic design, solving for the problems upfront allows for less time during the design development to be focused on um, changing the design. So we went through 15 charrettes, so 15 design workshops with our project partners, uh, coming up with goals in the beginning uh, that help to guide the project throughout. And throughout these charrettes incorporated project partners as well as staff and the entire design team. And the goal here was really to integrate the building and the landscape. Um, so going through many different iterations, looking at all of the resources on site, this is the, the upper campus here, trying to figure out what, what are we getting from that upper campus and how can we harvest it and use it on the lower <coughs> campus. Uh, many design iterations, looking at different, different options um, throughout the charrettes and, and offering, these, offering opportunities for feedback uh, from the public and from our partners. So each of the design phases were presented to the public um, through these charrettes. We invited numerous partners to the meeting and, and really it helped to inform the design. And you know, what you see here is, is pretty true to what the project is going to be. Now, this is the, this is the um, rendering of what the project is going to look like. This is the final design here. Uh, I didn't, and I have a lot more slides here, but I didn't include slides of construction drawings because I figured that we wouldn't want to go through those. But uh, this gives you an idea that the main entrance is up here, the historic conservatory, production greenhouse, tropical forest. Uh, the main entrance into the building here on the third story. And this is a 24,500 square foot building. This is that DPW building that I said was remaining and that portion that got demolished is here. And I'm gonna walk you through the features on the site. Uh, mention some of these. Here's some details on the cost. Energy usage, and we'll get into the energy details a little bit, but the energy usage, the pro projected energy use is about 80% less than a, a building, a conventional building, um, designed of the same size and same use. Uh, water capture, in case I forget to mention this later, we're capturing water on the entire site and also funneling water from the tropical forest and production greenhouse roofs, bringing those down to the lower sites that's gonna allow us to capture 1.3 million gallons um, annually, and what that will do is allow us to water, irrigate our uh, greenhouses up on the upper campus. So main features I mentioned earlier about the energy and the water. So I'm gonna walk through some of the features that are incorporated into the design. Uh, you can see here, once again, we're looking at whole systems. 
Okay, so how can we harvest some of the energy from the upper site? This is the new building, the lower building down here, and special events hall. Uh, what you're seeing here, B, is actually photovoltaic panels, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, so we were looking at ways that we could nestle the building into the hillside. I mentioned we had this 30-foot cliff, so how could we use that 30-foot cliff to our benefit um, to minimize the cooling and heating capacity, what, what, what would be needed to he uh, heat and cool this building uh, throughout the seasons to protect it. Uh, we were also looking at that hillside, again, as, as not as a challenge, but as an opportunity uh, to build up from the lower level and actually create an entrance from the upper level th through the roof. So it almost looked like that building was part of the landscape, so you're walking out onto that building rather than walking out to the lower, to the lower site and, and seeing this monstrosity. Um, looking quite a bit at um, solar uh, potential, um, exposure, uh, running a number of sun studies, and looking at different seasons, different equinox, or um, different times with the equinox. Where would the sun fall? Where would it bounce um, if we were orienting the building to the southeast or um, due south or southwest? And how would that affect uh, the rest of the, uh, the discipline? So while going through all of these different studies, all of these studies would be brought to the charrettes. They would be reviewed with the en entire design team. So the engineer could chime in and say, oh, well, if you orient the building in this direction and you add these um, sun shades or um, incorporate this style of, of window, that's going to reduce my capacity for cooling to, um, you know, to a certain level, which would then reduce your energy uh, consumption, which would then reduce your cost. So really uh, looking at that integrated design across all of the disciplines. And sorry, Day, I keep touching this microphone. You're gonna, it's gonna be a little bit loud. Um, natural ventilation, we were looking at a number of different different options for windows. So this is the southern facing wall here. Uh, looking at windows that were uh, almost like that double hung type of design. A window on the lower portion of the, the wall, window on the upper portion of the wall on both floors so that we could get maximized natural ventilation. This is going to be a building where we can actually open the windows, which is so, so unusual for an office building. Uh, we actually want people to be able to connect to the outside. So energy modelers, um, CJL, our engineer running models to see where exactly the air, would f air flows and basing the design and the design of the windows on the models. Uh, we incorporated a central atrium in the building and this actually s this serves almost like a chimney. So to pool air, uh, you can see here on, this, on the top, uh, the windows on the top here, when the windows are open, it almost pools air through the office space, up through the chimney, uh, and they're actually, you can't see them, but there are doors here, na they're called nano walls, and they open up to pull up the air. You mentioned uh, not only the design, but the operation, so who's, in, who's operating these units? Is it anyone? Great question, because we discussed that qu pretty much, um, that it was a several week long discussion. Uh, what we ended up deciding was the lower windows would be manually operated, and the upper windows would be operated, they'd be tied into the building management system. And this building management system is an unbelievable um, operation, operational tool where uh, it will be tied into everybody's computer so that at the end of the day, if any windows are open, there will be a sensor that pops up on the screen that says, in whichever pod you're in, your windows are open, go close them. Or if it's about to rain, something will pop up on the screen saying it's about to rain, go close your windows. So we really wanted to be able, we wanted the users to be able to engage with the building as well. So if they're cold and we, they haven't moved into the building yet. So we don't know how that's going to work because someone might be cold next to someone who's very warm. So I think there comes a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, office culture and um, if someone who's, who's usually cold, we'll, we'll probably have to go through some training where maybe they, that person maybe should be bringing a sweater to work, whereas the person next to them who is very hot should be wearing a short sleeve shirt and bringing layers. So there's going to be a lot of, um, there's going to be a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting learning experiences, I think, in, in learning to use this building. <coughs> so reducing uh, the energy loads, um, it, reducing the, the energy usage <coughs> was the first goal. Um, it, we incorporated an extremely robust um, building envelope. You can see the windows here also. 
Uh, we incorporated some local barn siding. So this is uh, wood from a barn that was harvested, from several barns that were harvested within the Western Pennsylvania region. Um, <coughs> And once we got, uh, once we reduced that, that energy need, that energy demand by a certain, uh, to a certain threshold, we then started incorporating the design of the renewable energy system. So three major systems, geothermal for heating and cooling, solar panels uh, for electricity, and this is a vertical axis wind turbine. Uh, this is different than the traditional propeller type of vertical, or excuse me, uh, wind turbine you usually see. This type of wind turbine was used in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge and they have had zero bird and bat deaths, which is why we chose it. It has a cut-in speed of only 4.5 miles per hour, but I have to tell you that it has been more of a learning experience than anything because we have only harvested about, like, I think it's like 20 kilowatt hours of energy from this thing that's been up for months. So. Um, It'll be a good learning tool for us, and we're going to continue to work with the folks in Pittsburgh to try to figure out how we can um, better the use of this. The solar panels are sitting on top. This is the Center for Sustainable Landscapes here. Solar panels are sitting on top of that um, adjacent Department of Public's work building and also the Special Events Hall, which is up on the upper campus. We have 125 um, kilowatts of uh, solar panels. And you can see here the geothermal system being installed. This is going to be uh, working in conjunction with a burner, B-E-R-N-E-R, -E tricoil energy recovery unit. This system was designed specifically for this project. It is much bigger than we ever anticipated. It's like a mini trailer on top of the roof. It's, it's quite big, but um, what it's able to do is harvest both heat um, and cool air from the, the building, uh, working in conjunction with the geothermal system, depending on the season. Uh, and, and what it does initially is it runs through a desiccant wheel, it reduces the humidity in the air, um, and the last stage is active cooling and active heating. So we're actually using um, uh, rec this as a recovery unit to maximize natural ventilation and um, non-mechanical uh, heating and cooling before resorting to that last step. And you can see here, this is the uh, floor system they're installing, and the um, the ventilation system actually goes underneath the floors and each desk space, this goes along with that operational question, each desk space has its own register and they can adjust the air that comes out of that, uh, that register. So the building, we had a, a grand opening on May 23rd, although the building isn't technically occupied yet, uh, but you can see this is the office space here. And I'll talk a little bit about materials later, and we'll so we'll talk about how healthy the indoor air is. Um, and just a, a quick little peek at, at signs that were going to be uh, displayed throughout the building. So uh, the building is modeled currently at using only 20% um, of the energy uh, that a, bu a typical building of this size and use would. And we, as I mentioned, we're not using a checklist, so we're actually going to be monitoring this uh, in conjunction with our partners from Carnegie Mellon and National Energy Technology Lab to, to find out how we're operating over the years. Any questions about the energy? Go ahead. Do you know if there's a calculation for what I call the energy intensity, how, many, how much energy is consumed per square foot? There is, and I don't, it's somewhere around 35. Yeah, and I do have those numbers, but I don't have them with me. But I'd be happy to share that with you. If you want to come up after, we can talk, and I'll get your info. Um, from the water side of things, I was just talking right before this presentation about the water, the sanitary water, and how coming from a city, this is so interesting to me because I thought these systems were so innovative. And, and, and having moved to Montpelier about Vermont two months ago, all of a sudden I'm realizing the septic systems, it, the system that we're using here in the constructed constructed wetland system is essentially the same thing that's been used for years and years and years. But in an urban setting, it's really interesting. Um, Pittsburgh is challenged with a combined sewer overflow system, and essentially what that means is decades and decades ago when the stormwater and the sanitary pipes um, were constructed, they were actually constructed as one. So the storm and the sanitary water flows in one. So you flush your toilet, and then you pour water down the, um, the sewer, and it's going through the same pipe. 
But what ha and all that water goes to a sewage treatment plant. And what happens during times of storm, during heavy rains, uh, the sanitary system is still contributing to that, that same system, and those, those pipes are overloaded with water. And when there's too much water to, for the sanitary, um, for the water treatment system to handle, it expels the water into the rivers. And that's fine if it's just storm water. But we're mixing it with the sanitary water. So in an old city like Pittsburgh, that water is ending up in our rivers. And we get our drinking water from the rivers. So it's a really interesting um, uh, kind of closed or semi closed loop there that's a little bit, a um, little scary. So what we're trying to do here is, is educate about the importance of, first of all, wa reducing water use and water consumption. So using waterless urinals, low flow, um, low flow fixtures, um, and instead of going the compost toilet route, we decided to go through a construct two-stage constructed wetland system with a sand filtration system uh, because we thought this had a little bit more application for urban, urban settings. So we want this to be replicable within the urban setting. So this water does flow th from the building uh, through first stage is a settling tank. Um, second stage is uh, planted with plants. Uh, helping to clean the water, the roots and the microbes in the water, helping to clean that water. And then next it goes through a sand filtration system. After it goes through the sand filtration system, it goes into the building, uh, is treated with UV, and then is sent to this tank. This is a 1,700 gallon tank that is sitting right next to the building. And it's just literally directed right out to this tank. And that water continuously runs back through that UV system um, for a, however long the cycle needs to be until that water is distributed into, distributed into the building. And we use about, um, I think it's about, the demand is about 300 gallons per day. Now we had some challenges with the permitting for this in the Allegheny County Health Department, which is the county that we're in, um, were they, didn't, they were not going to permit us to drink this water, even though this water was going to be um, essentially pharmaceutical grade water. So we have to bring water in, tap water, uh, that's going to be distributed through the faucets from the municipal system. So what that means is we're going to have extra water every day going down the sinks, more water than we need to flush the toilets. So we discovered this really great system. It's called the Epiphany System. And it's actually made locally, uh, just a few miles north of Pittsburgh. And essentially what this is, is it's a solar collector. And the solar collector um, is connected to a large vessel that runs, that has a tube running through it with a glycol solution. And these solar collectors collect enough energy and enough heat to heat this glycol solution inside this vessel, in, inside these um, tubes, to 800 degrees. And water is sitting inside this vessel as well. So that water is heated to 800 degrees, so heating it to a pharmaceutical grade um, water. And what we've decided to do with this, it's great. It's essentially distilled water. And we have an orchid collection that needs water, so it needs distilled water. So we're going to be feeding our orchid collection with this excess water that comes from this system. So that's the sanitary side of things. Um, mm -hmm. But so <coughs> if they would have given you the permit, Yes. Stuff? Yes. So it's not rainwater and going back. It's actually the same water. Right. Stuff right. Exactly. Um, no, I should actually tell you that this system, this does get an input from some stormwater to fill this tank. So it, there is a little bit of an input there of storm that then goes through the UV system, mixed with the sanitary water, and um, so essentially yes, though. And I know we're at 8 o'clock now, so um, I, do, I, just wa I want to go through the stormwater, but um, I won't be offended if anybody needs to get up to leave. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there, but you're welcome to stay. With, to, this is nearly the end. Um, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get as much in there as I could. So stormwater management, as I mentioned, it's a 2.6 acre site. Uh, we have quite a bit of water to deal with here. And what we wanted to do was try to connect this system with the upper campus as much as possible. We use, on average, 20,000 gallons of water per day to water the collections in the upper, on the upper campus. 
So um, harvesting water from the roofs of these buildings, and the reason we didn't harvest water from these buildings is because we use a whitewash to help shade the historic buildings, and that's part of our 10-year strategic plan is to get uh, to move away from the chalk-based whitewash and incorporate energy blankets that are on the inside. But um, we use energy blankets in these buildings so there's no coating on the outside of the glass. So we're, ca there we're directing, directing the water from these buildings down to the lower site. We're also capturing water that's falling on this site. Um, it's being directed into um, pipes that are running downhill, essentially running into a couple of different systems here. You can see the the walkways here, uh, the water is being diverted into pipes that are running down to the lower level. This is, um, this stairwell here is like right here. So we're looking at, um, looking at these two photos from two different directions. The water is going into a uh, 100,000 gallon lagoon system. And then right beyond the lagoon system, so this is the lagoon, and then right beyond there, right here, I actually have, another, I think the picture right after this, this system. So the lagoon is here, the historic buildings down here, the CSL, the Center for Sustainable Landscapes is here. Uh, the water flows from the lagoon system into this underground um, water holding system. It's called um, aqua blocks, and it's essentially modular blocks. They look like crates. Uh, it's lined with a, an, an impermeable rubber liner, and it basically just creates um, volume underground for water to be captured. So this is 80,000 um, gallons of water can be captured at any given time, and half of this. The other half is unlined, so this is the, the, um, the bed that's actually going to infiltrate into the ground. And what we'll be doing from this, you can see here, this is a more recent photo of the lagoon system that's full. Here's the infiltration bed. Uh, we'll be harvesting that water, sending that up to the upper campus for irrigation, and then we'll also be sending it back to the building to irrigate the green roof, and which has already been planted and is be growing beautifully, and also for maintenance needs. Um, we have reduced our irrigation needs on site to zero because we planted with 100% native plants that are native to the ecoregion, which means um, uh, the, um, the natural ecosystem surrounding FIPS. And as you can see here, just some renderings of the site, um, just showing some of those. Uh, the views of what the landscape will look like. But we'll also have some really great features on site. It's not just going to be a big meadow. Uh, we'll have an amphitheater. We'll have place for seating. And we had to go through such a rigorous process with every single manufacturer, every single subcontractor. Turner, who was our general contractor, they had one person on staff who managed the submittal process. So every single project product that's incorporated into this project, she knows about. And she knows that there is no red list materials in any of these, pro in any of these products. So um, because of this, for instance, the hillside, we have this huge 30-foot slope. We have brought in engineered soils. And initially, we, the landscape architects had specced soil that um, contains a geofiber. Um, that was actually made out of um, HDPE plastic, which was not permitted. So what we had to do was go back to the manufacturer, and they worked with us to create a new soil uh, that was made with carpet fibers that, that did not contain any red list materials. So this is the first time they've ever done this. And this, this example kind of applies to a lot of, a lot of the uh, materials on site, which we don't have time to get into tonight. But what you're seeing here is some major erosion from the first major rainstorm that we had because it just didn't hold. So it's really interesting because now we're going to go back to work with the soil manufacturer again to see if they can come up with another system. So this is part of the delay in this, pro in this project. As great as, um, as it has been with the timing, we've had, we've had many delays because we're one of the first to do it. So um, it's really been a, a great learning process. So the materials, as I mentioned, there's no red list materials in the project. So that goes for everything. Um, it actually did not, does not ring true for FF&E, so the furniture and the fixtures, the equipment. Um, but we still wanted to carry that spirit of the living building challenge through. So we worked even with the, um, 
the, um, the desk space manufacturers to make sure there's no red list materials. So this air is nearly as, nearly as clean as it is outside, actually probably cleaner because air outside in the city especially can be five to ten times more polluted than indoor air. Um, we've already talked a lot about research and education, so I am going to wrap up here, especially because we're over time, so I apologize about that. Um, but I did just want to put a couple of these slides up to show you that um, you'll have to visit our website if this project interests you because we're going to have real-time monitoring showing how this building's operating, capturing water, re reusing it from uh, water, energy. You can see heating and cooling, all of that um, information up there. And you'll have to come to Pittsburgh to check it out because it's... Um, we're going to have a lot of uh, research going on. We'll be building a research department to focus on um, a lot of the different studies that I mentioned and working with the universities to understand how the building and landscape operates. So there's just a, an, an image for you um, to I'll close with. So um, thank you so much for coming today. And, ho and I'm, I'm going to be here. So if anybody has any questions, I know there's, there's a lot of detail that I couldn't touch on tonight. So hopefully that overview um, spark some interest and feel free to come up and ask any questions. Thanks very much. <laughs> and I can take group questions if anybody has a question uh, they would like to ask. How did you get involved in this project? Myself personally, um, I have I've been at Phipps for, well, for four years, and I was actually um, a, an education specialist with them years ago. And I went back to school to get a degree in landscape architecture. And this position had opened up, and initially the position was for um, sustainability coordinator and related to gar and helping to design gardens. And this building was just, the design process was just starting. So it was just a natural fit. Um, so I started attending the meetings, and that's, that's how I was brought on. Great question. Um, okay, so for a living building challenge, it's very different than LEED. LEED is on the honor system. So you go through a design and a construction phase of like a checklist. You submit your information. They have um, auditors who essentially go through the process and they award you. Living building challenge is very different. So we go through the design process. Um, we document everything that we've done, and we are required to monitor our energy usage um, for one full year. And we're also required to commission the building. Um, I believe that that's for three years. We're not required to monitor water, which is really interesting to me because that is a requirement. But we are, we are metering the water anyways. So uh, they will come to the site after a year. So we will not get certification for at least a year. And there are three there's actually two projects that have been certified to date, and there are several that have received pedals. You don't have to, um, to receive recognition from Living Building Challenge, you don't have to go through the whole, you, you can receive one or two or three of those separate pedals. Um, but the two buildings that have been certified, certified, from what we understand, it has taken an average from 14, I think it's about 14 months, so between 12 and 18 months to get, um, to get everything lined up, to get their systems actually operating as they should, um, so a little bit longer than a year. Is this uh, living building challenge applicable to smaller buildings, or is it scaled to commercial buildings? It's definitely, definitely applicable. Uh, actually, one of the buildings that received several pedals was a home. And it, it was, um, where's that home? <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, it's on their website. ILBI, International Living Building Institute, is their website. So, uh, but yeah, they, they actually put it out there that it's, it can be applied to new buildings, retrofits, houses, buildings of all sizes. Was there any attention paid to electronic solutions? In terms of the... Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Oh, for electricity? Electricity usage, or are you talking about like the, the production of? Well, in the, in the, in the final uh, building, mm -hmm. is there any um, attention paid to electronic like, EMFs or anything like that? Um, not necessarily. That's actually, that's one component that has not been discussed. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because we've been focusing so much on the fact that the electricity will be generated on site and looking at that from 
um, in order to operate the, the equipment and the electronics. That's, that's one component that we've been focusing on. Um, and it's not discussed in the challenge. So we actually, no, it, that's, that's one piece. And we, we did have somebody ask us that um, not too long ago about the, um, also the, the waste and the disposal and, and how, do you, um, how do you manage that process. So something that hasn't really been focused on. But good question. Yeah, we'll definitely take it into consideration. It's something that we should do more research into. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So there is there's a like a carbon footprint calculator. Um, they do go through a pretty meager process. The Living Building Challenge does. Uh, we went way beyond that, though. We worked with the um, we worked with the University of Pittsburgh and their engineering department to go through a very very comprehensive life cycle assessment of the building. So that's looking at everything um, from the um, the heart the origin of the materials all the way through. Uh, to the, um, the death of the material, you know, the, the landfill process. Uh, so that's in progress right now, and we are trying to help inform that, that process for the Living Building Challenge because they just use a very simple calculator online that it took us, I think, five minutes to, to figure out, which is, it, it really does not speak to all of the, the pollution and the resources that go into um, that, that whole process. And one of the reasons that we did choose a local team was so that we could limit the amount of um, resources that it would take to get the, the consultants to the site for the charrettes and um, the construction. What about the regular maintenance of, uh, of this? Uh, yeah, so there's some, um, we are, I think we're bringing on one, one horticulturist and one maintenance person, a maintenance engineer. And the engineers and the landscape architects have worked with us very closely to come up with a maintenance and an operation schedule. And that was one of the, um, we're actually, because the construction has been so lengthy and it's been so in depth, it's one thing that we're behind on. And we just last week had a meeting with um, our water engineer to find out exactly how we need to clean out the constructed wetland system and the lagoon system. So it's, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, they, they discuss, they've discussed with us that there's going to be more maintenance, um, not necessarily more, but different, different maintenance than mm -hmm. with the traditional building. And it's going to be a little bit more hands-on, uh, but the systems are going to be uh, pretty self-sufficient in operating. And that's something that we'll learn about, too. You know, one person may not be enough. Uh, the cost, though, the cost to maintain, um, there are definitely going to be costs to it, and probably more costs for anticipating uh, the maintenance cost to be higher than conventional building. But uh, that's heavily offset by the, um, the reduced, uh, nearly, nearly zero energy and, and water costs. Yes, yes, and we're still, we're still waiting. We're still waiting to do that calculation because the process has taken a lot longer. Um, we, we anticipated being done in fall of 2011, so it's nearly a year longer. So we will have an answer to that, um, so I don't know what it is, but, but keep in touch, not letting you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. What was that parabolic heating system called? Epiphany. And I think they're, they're either out of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, or New Kensington, K-E-N-S-I-N-G-T-O-N. -I -I one of those, but just, just north of Pittsburgh, E-P-I-P-H-A-N-Y. And they've actually, um, that, the guy who started that system, he has installed quite a few of them in India and in Africa, um, where they've, and he's, he's actually come and done, he did a presentation at Phipps and was, showing us imagery of, of, of people who hadn't had clean water. Um, you know, they walk miles to get clean water, um, and they've installed these systems. He, pretty amazing guy, because he's uh, donated quite a bit, but they've installed these systems in villages and smaller towns that don't have clean water, and these folks um, are really benefiting from that. So hopefully, um, hopefully that'll continue to grow. Did you have any difficulties to get by, of course you said it, uh, but, 
Oh yeah. Yes. Like for anything specifically. Um, yeah. So let's see. What else have we had to do? Um, the it, not necessarily that we've had to actually change. I think the soil was the only one that we actually had to have them come up with a new system or you know a new uh, recipe for. The others we were they were able to um, either leave out a certain material or um, substitute uh, like a sealant or something. One of the things that we, that we experienced was the Living Building Challenge did permit us if we experienced, um, if we were going to be up against a wall and we were going to lose our warranty on a prod product and there were just no other solutions out there, there were those opportunities where they said, okay, if, there, if, there's, no other if there's no other manufacturers out there, you've, you've searched across the country, um, if there's no other options, they would. They did permit um, the use of, of some materials. So, and they're you know just calling them exceptions. And um, for every single manufacturer that did not comply with or refused to come up with a new recipe or work with us, we actually had to write a letter that was signed by Phipps, the general contractor Turner, and the Design Alliance, who's the architect, saying, you know, we don't condone this. We believe that you should uh, change your manufacturing process. This is the, this is the way that the world is moving. Uh, this is the direction uh, we're moving. And, and look at how much LEED has done for uh, the manufacturing sector. So um, we believe that, you know, in order to stay on top, of, on top of things, you should change your product. So we don't know what kind of a... Uh, impact that's going to have. But I think it's, it's important to show that the designers and the contractors aren't going to be specking the proje products that uh, those manufacturers are using. So maybe that'll help make a difference. Just on that, um, <coughs> the red list included formaldehyde and PVC. Mm -hmm. um, and are they like nowhere all on the site or just within panels? Because they'd be very hard to avoid Yes, yes. So formaldehyde, there's an interesting. Um, story about formaldehyde. <clears throat> we have 38 doors in the building, and we could not, simply could not afford to buy solid wood doors. There's um, two types of formaldehyde, urea, and what's the other one? Yes, okay. So uh, one is very easy to, to um, not use, and the other, I can't remember which is which, but uh, it was just absolutely impossible to find doors that were solid wood, uh, that were within our price range, and we could not find um, doors that were not solid wood that did not have, I think it was urea. <clears throat> so what we had to do instead, totally change our tune. Uh, we searched far and wide the Pittsburgh region and found salvaged doors from a... Um, from an office building, Alcoa office building downtown, and we brought those, we salvaged those doors, uh, repainted them, and um, installed those on site. So the FF and E, essentially the furniture, anything that's re anything that's movable, um, is is exempt from the living building challenge from that red list of materials. But FIPS, we went through a submittal process for absolutely everything. So even though the cubes and the chairs and every, all of the office materials um, were, were technically allowed to have those red list materials in them. We actually, we went through a very lengthy process uh, with six different um, interior, men, or, um, the office furniture manufacturers and uh, chose one that was, that was able to create and that, that is actually an example. They went through their process. Um, they, they worked with their manufacturer to remove uh, those materials from their products. So I'd like to say there's nothing in the building, but I would venture to guess that something has gotten past us. Um, but that's what's interesting about the Living Building Challenge is that if you fail on one small point, you fail the challenge. So that's why we've been so diligent uh, to ensure that that we've really been um, as, as clear as possible with all the manufacturers. And, um, so good question, and, and hopefully no, but, but I don't know. If it were up to us, and it is, you know, as, as far as we've, as much as we've had to say about it, no. There have been, there's no products um, in the building with those materials. No PVC. No PVC. No oh, no, 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 absolutely not. No PVC. No, definitely not. Even down to, there's this organization in Toronto that is 
Um, they're testing, they're doing some research on native bees. And they have um, a PVC pipe system where they have a, a bee nesting system inside the PVC pipe. And we wanted to put it on our green, they're testing these, um, they're installing these on green roofs. And they're collecting data at the end of every year, you're supposed to send back the system. And we found out that it was a PVC pipe and we tried to work with them to come up with another little nesting system. Can you make it out of any other material? And they wouldn't. And even though that's technically FF&E, we, we wouldn't buy it. So we'll make our own. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, uh, did you get the glass made from the energy use, renewable energy use kind of glass? Or what? Great question. No. No. Unfortunately, no. Um, no. For the Sustainable Sites Initiative, which is something I didn't talk about today because we would have been here until 11 o'clock tonight, but Sustainable Sites Initiative is essentially lead for landscapes. So you're looking at um, every, you're looking at the building envelope and beyond and everything within a project, um, looking at the, looking at it from the same perspective as you do lead. So energy, water, materials. Uh, one of the questions that they, one of the um, potential credits that they offer is sourcing all of your materials from manufacturers who do have responsible practices. So, for instance, manufacturers who do use uh, renewable energy on site um, or renewable energy to produce materials and uh, you know, harvesting water and, um, you know, Xing out red list materials. But that's not something that the Living Building Challenge um, actually, that's nothing that they put out. Um, but as part of that, I think we had one manufacturer for the landscape materials that actually um, that, that was complying with the, those credits. So it's like impossible to, to find manufacturers out there right now. Any other questions? What is your website again? Uh, the Living Building Challenge is ilbi.org. Oh, yeah, I have my, oh, and here's my, here's our website, uh, fipscsl.org. So that stands for the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. And feel free to, um, send me an email if you have any questions. And I'm not there, but if anybody, if you're ever going to be in the Pittsburgh area, I can definitely set you up with a tour. So, um, and it'll be open to the public, too. All right. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, FIPS is an interesting organization. Uh, we don't really have much of an endowment. Like someone like Longwood Gardens in Philadelphia has an, uh, some, some crazy endowment from DuPont. Uh, FIPS doesn't really have much of an endowment, but built into this project, the, the project cost was $24 million, and $4 million is going to be an endowment. So we have reached that part, part we've partly reached that goal. Um, but. We currently have a sub, I think it's $7 million operating cost, and that's going to go up, but we don't know how much right now. Um, I actually don't know what it's anticipated to go up by, but that endowment is going to um, be used for both research and for um, upkeeping the building and, and hiring new people as well. All right. Thanks so much for coming, and I'll be here for a little bit, so if you think of any other questions, feel free to come on up and ask. <laughs>